I'm gonna start things off by introducing Connie Gray. Connie is a champion of fashion illustration and the owner of Gray MCA in London, a leading international art gallery that focuses on fashion illustration and modern artist textiles. She is a curator and currently has an exhibit on display as part of Master Drawings New York titled Drawing on Style, Masters of Fashion Illustration, which is on view until January 29th. And I will definitely put information in the chat about that. So thank you so much, Connie, for being here. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you to everyone. And I understand that there is, we have a really amazing amount of attendees tonight or today, according to where you are around the world. Um, I am currently sitting in New York um, and joined by four of the most eminent fashion illustrators of our time. Um, some of which have been working for over 50 years in the industry and really are champions of this genre. I, I am very passionate about it. And I believe very strongly that this isn't just illustrative art, it is indeed fine art. And that is something that we've, we're coming here together to um, discuss this evening. Now, I can't tell you um, off the top of my head, the brilliance of all these illustrators. So I'm afraid I've had to write this down, but we are joined this evening um, by uh, firstly, Bill Donovan, who is one of the most prolific and esteemed fashion and lifestyle illustrators working today. Alongside his work as a superb and of course highly respected illustrator, he's also an artist, author, educator and spokesperson. And I can honestly say that I don't know anyone who works harder to champion this genre of art than Bill. And to underline this fact, Bill has in fact been held the title of artist in residence at Dior, at Christian Dior, for the last, um, well, since 2009. And that's a title that no other fashion illustrator has officially mm. ever been honored with, apart from Rene Gruel, but that was an unofficial title. So he really is, Bill is a very, very special illustrator. Um, and I'm deeply <laughs> honored to have him here with us. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce Glenn Tunstall, who is the undisputed A-list fashion illustrator from the 1970s and 80s, and whose work was regularly seen in US Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, the New York Times, and most importantly, Women's Wear Daily, which was the Bible of fashion in those days. And it was literally read by everyone, whether they were in the industry or whether they were just followers of fashion. It's fair to say that um, Glenn really was championed by the greats of American fashion, including Ralph Lauren, um, Halston, um, Bill Blass, um, Kenzo, Versace. Everyone looked to him to, for him to illustrate their, their collections. Um, he's now a um, professor or teaches at Parsons New School of Design and very possibly others, but I can't remember all of the art school names. Um, but he really is a great advocate of fashion illustration and also a highly regarded fine art painter in his own right now. And I think you will see a beautiful um, work of his behind him um, as we talk to him. We also have Stephen Stiffelman. Now, he was one of the key illustrators from Women's Wear Daily back in the absolute heyday. He joined that Women's Wear in 1965 and went on for 25 years to work illustrating all the great American designers. And also in Paris, he'd be sent to illustrate Dior, Yves Saint Laurent, Corrège, um, Pierre Cardin. And his style is exceptional. And it is such an honor to have him with us today and for us as a gallery to represent his work. Um, he teaches, he's an esteemed professor at FIT. Um, and is a, just a wonderful, wonderful advocate, as everyone is, of fashion illustration. And lastly, but absolutely by no means least, Jason Brooks, who is beautifully, generously giving up his time at 11 o'clock this evening in England. It's six o'clock here, but it's 11 o'clock in England. So thank you, Jason, for joining us. Um, Jason is an award-winning British fashion and lifestyle illustrator who first made his name back in the 1980s when he brought fashion illustration to life using uh, computer techniques, which had never been seen before. It was, it was groundbreaking. Um, he's known for his inspirational, glamorous and aspirational images. 
and he's worked has worked since the 1980s with the most luxurious brands um, that you can think of, from um, Tiffany's, Chanel, Longcom, uh, Ritz Hotels, uh, Super Yacht Monaco. He's also worked for British Vogue, for Elle. I mean, it's endless. And it is a very, very great honor to have him joining us um, today as a very, very successful commercial artist. Unfortunately, we don't have David Downton with us. And we've had some tricky technical issues, but I know that he's with us in spirit and most probably watching. So if you are, David, um, hello, we miss you, but um, we know you're with us in spirit, as I say. And lastly, the panel tonight is, thank God, not being moderated by me, but by a fabulous, very well-respected um, journalist and author, Susan McCarthy. And she also is the author of Kenneth Paul Block, um, drawing fashion, which I actually have here, but it's right at the bottom of the pile, so I can't show it to you. But it's a sensational coffee table book about one of the most important fashion, no longer with us. But I think that everyone in the panel tonight will all agree that he was an absolute master of his genre. So with no further ado, I would like to hand you over to Susan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. That was the great introductions. Thanks so much. And thank you to Lindsay for handling all the technical aspects of this. Um, well, we'll get started with a question for all four of, uh, of our panelists. Fashion illustration right now is really, it's come into its own. I mean, it's part of Master Drawings event in New York right now. It was on the block at Sotheby's in France with the Karl Lagerfeld estate sale. More and more major museums are collecting it. Places like the MFA the, in Boston have huge collections of fashion art. So what has been your experience, and go to each of you with this question, on how fashion art's been perceived throughout your career? Has it changed? Can you tell me a little bit about the perception of fashion art through, through your career? Let's start with um, Bill. OK. Um, I have a timer here for three minutes, so I just <laughs> I don't <laughs> run over. Um, for me, um, yeah, fashion illustration has evolved from when I started practicing it in the 80s, where, you know, the idea that an illustrator could survive just creating a figure on a page for an editorial or an advertisement, um, those days are long gone. And like anything, time moves on and fashion moves on quickly. And um, for me, it's changed as far as tech, technologically. Uh, technology entered into uh, the realm of fashion illustration because of photography and video, and that caused partly the demise for me of fashion illustration. It, did, it was no longer valid. And on the same aspect, it's kind of ironic that because of technology, today there's a resurgence because of social media and also because of Photoshop. And, and digital technology, which I'm sure uh, Jason will talk about a little later. And also there's this need today because everything is so technological that anyone could take a photograph and Photoshop it and turn it into an illustration that the art of actually sitting down on, with a piece of paper and drawing live and using the tools and techniques associated with fashion illustration have become so popular. And especially on Instagram and, and Facebook and, and all the social media. So for me, it, it, the resurgence is partly because of this interest, again, in doing something through the eye and through the hand that's real and isn't through primarily technology. And also because of the relationship between fashion illustration and, and uh, society. Mm -hmm. That's my there, Okay, great, great. Um, Stephen, how has it been for you, especially I mean, starting out at women's wear? You're on mute? I think your mute's on, Stephen. Yeah, I've been the longest uh, run illustrator in this group. Okay. Well, when I started, I mean, my first dream of being a fashion illustrator was when I saw Kenneth Paul Block drawing. Okay. That's what nailed it. And when I began, the fashion illustration changes like clothing changes. When I began, there were a gazillion department stores. There were lots of magazines, everybody used artwork. So I grew up my whole life 
um, then working at Women's Row and Henry Vendel. I grew up my whole life seeing and being around artwork. And it was something I just took for granted until the late 80s when photography started to come in and change it. A fashion illustration was able to convey a feeling a photograph, it creates more of a fact. But part of my illustration background was at women's wear when we wanted a feeling of the garment and, the, and we were not able to copy it. We didn't put the seams and darts in. But over the years, that's, that's really changed. And I, I'm gonna do two parts. I learned a lot from my students because just as like in the eighties, when the computer began, I kind of found it fascinating. Now I have students that are, let's say 20 years old, who have grown up with the computer. They find hand art fascinating because they've never seen it. And when they look at it, I bring Kenneth's book in, I bring some of my drawing, I bring everyone's own. They're fascinated. It's like fascinated by it. And suddenly, because it is not a career where we're seeing it printed every day, I think it's becoming highly collectible. Mm -hmm. When I worked at Women's Row, I did dozens of acrylic paintings a month. And I only took the ones I wanted. If anyone wanted one, I gave it to them. I never thought anything. But as something becomes rare, it does become collectible. And I think that would bring it into the level of fine art because it's no longer commercial. Hmm, that's, inter that's interesting. And now, J <clears throat> Jason, you come at it from a different angle because you've used mm. technology. T talk a little bit about that. Um, yes, that's right, Susan. Um, I really started using computers during the 80s, as Connie mentioned, um, when I was really just still at school um, and we got a computer in our, in our home. So I feel like my um, career as an artist, if you like, has spanned um, traditional media being taught in school and college um, through to technology first arriving. So my work has really been all about combining, you know, the latest technology with more traditional fine art materials. Um, and I, in a way I was able to kind of ride the wave of Photoshop appearing during the 90s when I left college, left the Royal College of Art um, and began my career. But I think um, to sort of go back to your question, it's to me, I think the really the public perception of fashion illustration and the awareness of fashion illustration, illustration has increased enormously um, since I first started. But I feel like perhaps the industry perception and the industry use of fashion illustration um, has got a way to catch up. And, and the popularity of fashion illustration now is, is huge, it's enormous. Um, especially amongst a sort of a younger generation, but we really perhaps don't see enough of it in, in you know, advertising and magazines and um, in print and online. So I think it's sort of an untapped resource, but there's no doubt a real love for, love for this genre um, exists. And I think that is increasing and I've, I've seen that increase enormously. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the, the point that Bill made about um, Instagram is a really important one because so many people have been introduced to fashion illustration through Instagram rather than, you know, magazines as they would have been Absolutely. in the old days. Absolutely, yes, yeah, I think that's very true. Now, so, Glenn, what has your experience been? How has, throughout your career, how has the perception of your, your profession changed or your art form? Well, uh, fashion illustration, uh, early on when I came into the industry, which was in the 70s, um, it was ubiquitous. Every company, every um, designer, uh, every um, product that had a fashion bent to it had utilized some type of drawing or, or illustration to capture the feel of that product. And it was, it was in a way that, um, couldn't be done by photography because photography hadn't quite married well enough with um, print journalism or um, print. So you had to use uh, more dramatic um, materials to make your point. Um, and it was 
uh, everywhere, as I said, people were used to it. Um, but I think when the when the illustrations started to turn more towards real uh, photorealism, I think it opened a window for um, photography to suddenly have a play a bigger role in in, in um, promoting uh, fashion images. Mm -hmm. but, but back in the day when I was going to school, which I did with St Stephen, um, we had to learn everything about the line. It was all about the line. And I think even now to this day, at least those from my generation, when you see it, you're thrilled by it because you knew that it took years and years and years of being able to control that line so that it would say exactly what you wanted to say as if it were a foreign language that you were that's being spoken with a paintbrush or, or a charcoal pencil. And um, I think it's those qualities that makes these drawings so um, sought after today because that type of effort um, is not necessary, you just don't see it. Mm -hmm. And it, it stands now on its own as examples of how great it, it was. That, no, it's, it's a good point. Um, I wonder, since you're talking about, you know, highlights of your career, can, can all of you think of maybe one particular assignment or one particular um, piece of a fashion art that you finished and you thought, that's it, I nailed it. Um, maybe it was the, the person that you were drawing or the fashion. Can you think of one specific um, piece that really stood out to you and made you think like, that, that's it, that's, that's fine art. Um, Jason, can you think of one? Hmm. Um, actually, I'm, I don't know if I can, Susan. I'm, I'm always <laughs> quite sort of um, down on my own work once I've created it. I'm very much the sort of person who wants to move on to the next uh, project, the next assignment. But one thing I am enormously grateful is um, for is how much travel this job has enabled me to do, which is something I really didn't expect. And it's um, taken me, you know, from Japan, New York, all over Europe, um, the Far East, uh, Australia. So um, I wouldn't necessarily be able to pin it down to one particular project but I think well for wh which what clients were you that. working when you're doing uh, those assignments which which type of clients are you working for um I, I think well with with my work um I've diversified a little bit to subjects surrounding fashion so mm -hmm. I've brought in travel architecture what's sort of known as lifestyle um uh, uh, illustration in a way to become perhaps a little bit more commercial than I would have done if I had just stuck to fashion mm -hmm. because I've always found I mean I'm just talking from a sort of British perspective because that that is the that's all I've really known but in my experience I found fas the fashion industry itself um, hasn't been a great source of actual uh, lots and lots of uh, projects and assignments most of my work has come from hotels, all kinds of different brands. You know, sometimes I've worked with big fashion labels like Chanel, but it's not, that's not my kind of main um, area in a way. But um, I, I think I'm more, more grateful for the incredible experiences I've had, I, I would right, say. Right. Well, that's great. Um, Glenn, can you think of a particular assignment that really stood out to you or, you know, a uh, piece of fashion art that you just really, you didn't want to give it away, let's put it that way. You wanted to keep it for yourself. Oh, I have a few of those. <laughs> uh, um, I think that you get a thrill when you work for certain um, designers and their garments are just so inspiring. I mean, they're the epitome of fashion or something like that. Um, 
but I personally, my feelings are in the drawing itself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can whip up a drawing. I did this, this sketch of stripes, which makes me think of you, Jason. Um, where she had on a striped hat and a striped dress and she's on the floor and she, and it's like it's just a wisp you know it's just a whip like that and the drawing is just kind of completes itself and it was so um pleasant uh to have uh, that experience and this is probably after a lot of different efforts trying to make it right where you know you kind of go through those changes and then you finally find that point mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and well, it's something in the hand it's just something in the hand and i don't think that you i don't think that we actually possess it ourselves i think the hand possesses it you know, I'd love to go back to something that Jason, um, you mentioned earlier, you said that the fashion, you got a lot of um, satisfaction and assignments from um, non-fashion related fashion art and lifestyle art. Why do you think the fashion industry is um, at times, or right now, um, less open to using fashion art? Um, what do you think it is? And what have you maybe, it, 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 any of you can chime in, what have you done to sort of make them more aware and perhaps bring more um, attention to it? Bill? Did... Um, well, here, here, this is the dilemma. There's such an appreciation for fashion illustration and what it can do. And, and, and it's unlimited for me in scope to take the tools and techniques associated with fashion illustration like stylization, exaggeration, flair, et cetera, and apply it to something outside of the fashion figure. That's what I'm doing now. I'm working on a book and it's not a fashion book. It's, it's, it's a classic novel. Uh, what is unfortunate or what is the situation now, although there is this huge appreciation on Instagram and a renewed interest and attention to fashion illustration, we, as illustrators need to educate the upcoming art directors and creative directors and how this work can be utilized. Mm -hmm. And I feel eventually for these people that are fans of it on Instagram, they will be in a position one day where they will be able to hire someone. And I, I'm optimistic that they will see uh, how invaluable fashion illustration is to the marketplace and to the editorial market. I, I uh, harking back to talking about you know, uh, fine art. Uh, I have a I have a degree in fine art after fashion illustration, and for years I separated both of them. I, you know, I paint under William Donovan, and I do my fashion under Bill Donovan. And I finally gave myself permission to combine them a bit, and I did some work for uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I had to do twelve illustrations in three weeks, and I was panic stricken. And I just thought, you know, they had to be the best thing I ever did in my life. And as you guys all know, that's a killer, it's dead in the water. And I just said, you know what, Bill, they hired you to do this, do what you do. And I did one and it was the first time I stopped and I thought I did it, you know, that, that piece is it, that combined it, it's from my heart and soul. And it made me look at fashion illustration and the show that's up now and I, and I hark back to, you know, Kenneth Paul Block and Stephen Stippelman and their work. And I look at Turner's backgrounds and their paintings and how Stephen moves paint on the figure, I mean, those figures are ethereal and they're floating off the page and they, they're paint. It's just paint. This man can move paint like no fine artist can. And, and mm -hmm. for me, there's no blurring of the boundaries. You know, for me, the illustration, fashion illustration should have a place of fine art. And it, it's just so remarkable and nice today to see that that's finally happening. You know, there's, there's, there's a wonderful book that um, about fashion drawing in vogue that David Hockney wrote the introduction for. And at the end, he says, the best of these artists were artists first and fashion artists second, um, which, the, the, I mean, the book was published, I don't, I don't know how long, it was a while ago, but it, that, it, that it, still yeah. remains true. I mean, the people, fashion artists were trained and they, you know, their, their skills are, I mean, they're really trained, they're the same. So, um, so I want to ask each of you, it just, I'm Steve, Steven, yes. 
No, you're muted. It's a very funny question, which I, I didn't get to answer. When Oh, go answer, please. No, when you said which was the piece of art that you thought you arrived. Yes, okay. yes. A million times, and then a month later, you would arrive at a better one. <laughs> but the, the, the most significant thing for me, I loved a lot of my work at Women's Wear because I was able to draw dresses that didn't exist on women that I never saw. And um, one of the first big, big, big cover and inside that I ever got, the art director came over to me. I was so young, I was living at home still. And he said, Jacqueline Kennedy just went to Italy and she bought some dresses from Valentino and we're doing one from the cover. And it was gonna be my first portrait night. And I was so happy and I was so nervous. And then he goes, and here's the other seven for the inside. And I stayed there the entire night to do it. And when it was printed, it was, I was very proud that I accomplished it, you know, at, at you know, and it was, it was beyond a dream. But um, I find the drawings that I find my favorite all relate to a moment and an experience more than a drawing, mm -hmm. you know, like, or more than, I like the paintings, but they all have a story to them. Like where I was at that moment, what garment I was drawing, what, my friends were, what the world around me was. And um, each, it relates to a moment of time, but there's no, you, if, you, if you, you can have favorite drawings, but when you think you've reached it, uh, that's not a good thing. <laughs> so yeah, but Stephen, what happened to those drawings? I have, I have, I've kept every drawing that I truly wanted to keep. But I've given away 20 times more than that because it was just something I did. I was very fortunate to be able to do it. And if someone liked it and it didn't matter that much to me, I felt give it to them, it'll make them happy. But I'm still left, I don't have a million, but I have the ones that are very dear to me and the ones that um, I'm oh, happy That's with. great, that's great. So um, you, when you, when you think about, okay, when did other artists that influenced you, they don't have to be fashion artists. I mean, the art that you collect, what, what artists are in your personal collection, fashion art or you know, any, other, any other type of art? Glenn? Well, well I, I think okay. um, really, I, I agree with what Glenn said a minute ago, that it's, it's the line is everything really to, to me as well. And, um, when I was growing up, I was fascinated by artists really more than illustrators who were superb draftsmen, you know, people like Picasso and his um, Vollard suite and Egon Schiele, Matisse, Saul Steinberg, um, anyone who was uh, Ben Shahn, anyone who had an incredible um, facility for drawing and using ink or pencil, that that's what I, you know, that's what made me really excited. And I think that hasn't, hasn't particularly changed. Um, really, my background was perhaps with all of us, but I was more aware of fine art more than illustration and particularly fashion illustration was something I wasn't really aware of until um, further on in, into my career. Um, but I've always loved drawing people and that's what sort of drew me into fashion illustration. It was, it was a fascination with drawing people, line and style, I suppose, but I, I didn't really know how to define it at that stage. Um, it, but it's, I, I, I actually think it's one of the most difficult and exacting um, disciplines to do well. I think in all the arts, it's, in, it's an incredibly th difficult thing to do successfully, to create a brilliant fashion illustration. It's something, you know, many fine artists would really, really struggle uh, to, to, to be that accurate and to be able to convey movement, information, um, drama, sexiness, um, all the things that may be combined into an a fashion illustration um, 
it, it's just very, very difficult, the understanding of human anatomy. And, and I think um, Connie has assembled this sort of quite rarefied group of people who, who across, you know, different, different decades in a way, who, who all share this love for this particular genre and the, the, the um, you know, the artists on screen are incredible artists that really deserve to be recognized. And um, I think as Bill was saying, there's a groundswell of fascination with this, this genre and, um, and a love for it, which eventually I think will cross over into more and more commercial uses. And I, I think um, <laughs> it's something, especially with social media that, that you know, can't be ignored for, forever or, or seen as a lesser medium to photography necessarily. Mm -hmm. Fashion mm -hmm. illustration is very difficult because you are drawing something factually. I think that's the easiest part, but then you are giving it a feeling and an emotion. And I think that's yes. what separates everyone. Mm -hmm. I'd like to um, um, agree with that. And, and it's the pure fact that you have to be accurate, that you have to create something Fact. that's a total fantasy, but it's all based on realities. What are the proportions? What are the fabrics? What is the movement? You know, how does she look? You know, how is she wearing her hair? It's all these things that you have to be able to um, put down and in our generation, it had to be quickly. And nowadays, but digitally, you could take a longer time. You can make many corrections. You don't have that kind of option uh, in the past. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, one of my greatest in in uh, influences was uh, the high school that I went to, Cass Tech, where I learned uh, fashion illustration, and then on to Parsons. And then I was fortunate enough to get the job at Women's Wear Daily. And I got to sit next to Stephen Steppelman. And it was like school continued. Wow. <laughs> For all those years, he was constantly pushing me faster, 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 or, you know, get this done, or, you know, and he would laugh and, you know, and push you at the same moment. And I felt like my uh, education in this kind of rarefied world, as um, Jason calls it, um, was really wonderful. Uh, and I can't thank you enough, Stephen. Well, Glenn, we had one thing. We had no deadlines. Everything was we need it now. That was the deadline. Right, was, exactly. There was no deadline. You got to right get it back you. with your left one. And that was it. <laughs> Yeah, people don't you know, really work like that anymore. I mean, the deadlines, Bill, what kind of deadlines will you get on an assignment for something? Uh, it depends. Um, usually, like for this book, I think I have a month and a half to cover. There are about 10 illustrations in total in, in the book, um, which is a short period of time. Usually you get nine months. To do but Dior part. doesn't say to you, I need this tomorrow. No. No, they, they, they're very generous with time. Uh, the most stressful one was the Met. That, that was just three weeks for that opera. What an incredible opportunity and, and just the, the pressure of that. But as I said before, you, you know, you just, you can't say it's going to be the best thing in the, in, in you'll ever do because that preciousness kills the job. But I did want to hark back to something that everyone said and Stephen. Uh, we have a friend, another illustrator, her name is Karen Sentry, and she spoke one time, and she said that fashion illustrators are obsessed. And I believe that. We are obsessed with anatomy and draftsmanship and looking and seeing, and uh, we, are, we are adept draftsmen because we, have, we draw every day. And we draw from light, and we draw from photos, and sometimes, in the case of Women's Wear Daily, you have to draw from your head. And the ability to be able to communicate a figure and understand the anatomy and how the clothing works is why you can translate that information into this stylized figure. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's not as easy as it looks, you know, and that's part of the charm. So, so what are some of the other things? I mean, you could say that um, fashion illustration um, reflects the culture and the culture reflects fashion illustration. So 
what what do you think besides um, putting the fashions on display? Do you think fashion illustration has a, any other influence on the culture? I mean, is that yeah? I, 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 over, I, I think, I... Um, there, there's there's a sort of people have a love of stories as well and storytelling, and um, I think that's another thing that that fashion illustration is brilliant for. Um, were you about to say something, Stephen, at that point? No, no, but I. I clothing, the world dictates fashion illustration. I mean, when I was in school in a very bizarre time because my fantasy when I was in high school was the Balenciaga world, but that was the fantasy. My reality was the Twiggy world, but I got <laughs> to mix a little bit of it. And, um, but the, if you don't, if your artwork does not reflect the time. It has to reflect the time. And if you, even if you go back to Sarge and Baldini, they reflected the times. To me, they were the first fashion illustrators. They reflected the times. So one of the things I keep telling my students all the time, don't get stuck. If you get stuck, you're dead. You have to keep growing and you have to keep evolving. And that's what that's why when you look at this exhibit, each of those beautiful drawings really reflected the moment, the woman, the attitude, the garment. It, and you couldn't take one from the 30s and put it from the 70s. And you couldn't take one from the 90s and put it in the 20s. And that's, I think, is what makes it so beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's very but, true. But people do have distinct, you know, someone, a fashion illustrator, develops a distinct style. It can go from, don't you think it can go from generation to generation? It evolves, and, it has, yeah. it evolves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had asked, I'm gonna, you know, go back to a question I asked earlier. Are, are what, what artists do you collect since we're talking about fine art? Hmm. Bill, do you, is there um, any? Well, the artists I like to collect, I can't afford. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, I, I you know, I love abstract expressionism. I love ah, this guy, okay. Martin, and I love Carol Walker. Uh, of, of course, I love Egon Chile and, and Gustav Klimt and, and Barbara Perlman. I can't even afford some of the fashion illustrators. Uh, <laughs> so I collect, I collect work from, um, from open shows, from students, uh, small pieces that speak to me. I, I don't mm -hmm. buy anything for an investment. I do own a Boucher and I have a Green Hill that someone gave to me, both of them. And um, I buy work that speaks to me, that I like to look at and tells me a story. And usually folks, it's dark. It, it's not sight, you know, fun and bright and sunshine, lollipops and rainbows. I, you know, I do that with my fashion. And, and uh, so I have enough of that, that brightness around me. You know, sometimes I need a little darkness in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Jake. Jason, do you have an, uh, do you have a, do you collect fashion art or other? Um, yeah, yes, to a certain extent. Um, I've got a it's really beautiful um, Antonio Lopez, which is um, it's the one that's often reproduced in books, and it was in the Antonio book, the most recent one. Um, of it's of two quite seventies um, women. It was a story from British Vogue, so having the original of that and seeing that every day is is incredibly it's inspiring. Um, and it combines colored pencil, um, bits of colored acetate, there's collage, there's little bits of ink. So you can really see the process that Antonio used to create mm. it. So that, that's, that's a particularly sort of treasured um, piece of artwork I have. But um, outside of that, I, I like British art, I suppose, you know, David Hockney, um, Ben Nicholson, uh, Victor Passmore, um, that kind of thing. So I've got a, got you know quite a few pieces which I which I live with and, and see every day, which um, is is you know it's a real privilege to kind of be a, a steward of them in a way for for future generations. Mm -hmm. um, but I've also books. I mean, I love, I adore books. I'm crazy about books, and um, I love. So, I think signed books are a, sort of an affordable thing to to collect, which I've, I always find really exciting. I've got you know signed books by Irving Penn and um, all sorts of different people. So that they, and you know, uh, David Bailey. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a fan of uh, 
all that kind of thing and I'm quite a collector. Oh, that's great. That's great. Stephen, are you, are you a collector of fashion or other art? I work, a, I have a lot of work from my friends mm -hmm. and um, I can't afford the Matisse that I was looking at. So Bill and I will have to figure out how we can do that. But um, no, I have work from friends. And like Bill said, I like work that is very personal. I, it's not to buy it because it's like, it has to say something to me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the work I, that I love, I unfortunately can only see in books. Yeah, yeah. Well, you could have, borrow some. Jason has quite a collection. He'll lend you some of his books. <laughs> well, um, I have a huge amount of books. I, I wouldn't mind the Matisse either, Stephen. <laughs> okay, so, so three of us might get a bargain. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, Glenn, well, I, I often think we should do an exchange. It would be lovely to send each other a postcard with a uh, with a signed drawing. By I mean, I'd be, I'd be very happy to do that. And um, that would be fun. That'd be fun. Maybe um, something Connie can help us uh, coordinate. At, yes, uh, that's great. Uh, Glenn, did, is there any particular fashion artist that you've collected or other artists that you're... Well, I, I collect the books. And um, of course, Antonio um, is comes to mind immediately um, because of uh, my personal connection to him. He was very instrumental in helping me when I uh, moved to Italy uh, and meeting people. I mean, just a great guy in so many, so many ways and a, a talent that was like supernatural when it comes to dealing with all the things we've been talking about for fashion art, you know, the anatomy, the line, the, the, the drama, all those things. Um, I wish I had was smart enough to have collected Stephen Stippelman's work when I had a chance. Um, his work, but I, I don't need to have the paintings to have the experience of watching him create all those beautiful paintings that he did. And his work was almost always um, paint, um, well, in color. Um, I also find that uh, my the person I always think of as the first, um, it, oh, I can't think of his name right this second. Um, but I, I just really um, have been very appreciative of uh, the work that's out there. And I wish I had it in my house. Okay. Um so I wanted to, to pose something because Glenn, you and Stephen, um, well, several of you teach. You teach at Parsons, FIT, Bill, you also teach. Um, and a lot of your students are doing, doing their work on computers rather than by hand. And Jason, you often work that way as well. So talk a little bit about that. And also, um, I think Connie mentioned that you're at you have an nft that's going up for sale this week or next week so um how how is that changing the field is that to me susan yes yes yeah um well i think um the fundamentals of what we do haven't really changed it's all about observation looking using our eyes looking at the human figure um and having that sort of meticulous attention to anatomy and the things that we've mentioned already so it all comes from observation it all comes from drawing drawing is the essential skill whether you're using computers or a biro a big biro it's it's all the same thing and i think i don't see a kind of high a hierarchy of media i don't think that oil painting should is real art any more than using a computer i think to me, there's, it's a level playing field. They're all just tools to use. And I think the snobbery that surrounds um, different media is, is, is sort of, to me, it seems a bit outdated really, because I've um, grown up, um, you know, using paint and gouache and collage and um, oil pastel sticks or sand on the beach, but then also used, you know, the latest of technology. So. 
I think that's perhaps the, the, the generation that Bill um, is more in tune with um, from his work at FIT and the, you know, the Society of Illustrators, you're, you're seeing young people who only know computers perhaps. And I, and I think, I, I don't know. I, I think there's that, you know, the importance of teaching drawing and, and practicing drawing is, is that still remains. Um, we still have. Susan, yeah. yeah, sorry. We, we still have our foundation classes. They have, oh, that's great. With, yeah. uh, uh, where they have model drawing, they learn all the techniques. Um, uh, going back we, to we your- We don't have that in the UK. It's, it's very much in decline, I think. The art colleges are in, you know, it's not taught enough. No, we have I a foundation in, year where they right. get, they do learn the computer. But I, my thing is, I agree with you, and I do not come from a computer world as far as any drawing whatsoever, but you still have to know your craft. In other words, so a computer, a pencil, uh, you don't just say to the computer, draw. It's like you don't say to a sewing machine, make a code. You still have to know the craft. The other is just the way you choose to execute it. But uh, my students are equal they're learning they learn by hand to start with mm. and when i see what they could do on procreate it kind of fascinates me but the beautiful work that they do on procreate are the students that could do the beautiful work by hand you know and i agree with you i think the com the computer is just part of it now it's not Did i jump in here valid yeah. yes um so interestingly enough i kind of bridge both of those worlds because I teach in a hybrid classroom. So we have models posing, which we draw from, and then we will take those drawings and, you know, scan them into Photoshop or Illustrator. What I have found is that the students, and these are illustration students, are more uh, passionate about doing the actual drawings and painting because they're used to the computer. You know, again, it's one of those things that's, you know, and I agree with everyone here that you it's need the deal. foundation, but I do think it's just as important to have the technological tools of Photoshop and Illustrator and Procreate, you know, but th those tools are only as good as your background in, in a traditional or, or the foundation of drawing and, and draftsmanship. Then you can soar. Without, those, without that foundation, you're just somebody that's utilizing filters and, and, and what's available to you. So mm -hmm. I think Jason, you we all agree on this as as illustrators. The, the knowledge, the foundation of painting and drawing from life, only enhances your your technological skills. So it's a good balance. Definitely, and yes, I, I think you know traditional art materials are absolutely vital, and I think there there is no substitute for experimentation and trying all, all sorts of different media really for, for young people and drawing you know their friends their boyfriends girlfriends their family people around them drawing from life is it is incredibly um you know a useful skill to 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 perfect really for what we do obviously so jason are you the first fashion illustrator to get involved in the world of nfts that you know of um, I, I think so. Um, I've, I'm launching, so this Saturday, um, I'm launching, it's called The Red Collection. So it's my very first NFT collection uh, launching to OpenSea um, this Saturday, 29th of January. Um, there's, there should be between 100 and 150 different fashion illustrations. Each one is completely unique. And um, it, it's just a really interesting new new world, I think, to to experiment with and explore. And I'm mm -hmm. collaborating with um, a brilliant technical person called James Klein. We're working together on this project, and um, hopefully, it'll be the first of several collections this year. And um, I, th I think it's just a really, really interesting interesting new area. Um, and, and I mean, I've been making digital artwork for, you know, since the early 90s um, and publishing it. So it sort of makes sense. I feel like I've kind of earned my place to, to dabble in this new mm -hmm. technology and, and see where it, where it leads. Right. Have, have, has anyone else thought about doing this or now that you've heard Jason describe it or 
<laughs> going to investigate? Oh, it's been on my mind. It's, it's been yeah, on my mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's there somewhere. I just don't have the time to develop it, and I need to know how to do that. But right. I, I think as um, illustrators and artists, you need to be open to everything. And, and, and well, if and we're talking here, about open. evolution here, so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that could be the next step. Um, so I know that it, we are going to be taking questions. Um, I was going to I was going to bring up one more. It's an interesting quote before we get um, to the questions in a, in a few minutes. Um, I was reading this this memoir called Swimming Studies by a, an illustrator named Leanne Shapton, and she talked about certain artists like Hopper and Warhol and Homer starting as illustrators and then moving to fine art. And she said. Quote, I think of illustration as a version of what we understand already, and in most cases we choose to be attracted to and see, whereas art reveals something we haven't yet seen that hasn't yet been articulated, at least not in a familiar way. And what's your take on that? Anybody can jump in there. Well, you know, my take on that is that, uh, is, yeah, I mean, fine art, ideally, we're just speaking ideally, uh, doesn't really need to speak to an audience. It's from the soul of the artist to create work that speaks to him or her. Mm -hmm. And so it's not commissioned by an art director and it's not commissioned by a creative director. It should be from their personal voice. However, I also feel that in illustration, especially fashion illustration, and we were talking about this before about, you know, where is the story? What, what is the narrative? They could be anyone. They can be anybody. Those women, I mean, Stippleman's women could be any woman on the street. You know, Glenn's girls, they're gorgeous. Who are they? You know, you don't know. It keeps it open-ended. And I personally, I think it's a little more subjective than just like the illustration is, you know, just the forerunner to the to the art. It's mm -hmm. it's what what are you attracted to? Mm -hmm. You know, there, there, you can't say that an illustration is not at the same level as a painting mm -hmm. because there are paintings that are not at the same level as an illustration. There are two different genres of work and both have their place in, in the art world. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, and I think it's going to happen, fashion illustration is finally with this show being part of you know Master Drawing Works New York has elevated this genre to a level that it's never been before. So right, right. That's, what, that's my feeling. Okay. Um, does anyone else want to weigh in on that? No. Um, yeah, I, I think um, we, you know, we all have a sort of world of our imagination as as well as our commercial work, and I I, I think it's um, perhaps there's a sort of a certain art to bringing our personality into our commercial projects and, and um, having opportunities to use our imagination and bring in other other aspects of our um, creativity is really important. And I, I think that can, can really provide more satisfaction than just answering a brief. I think if you can use your imagination, and for me, I love kind of creating a world around my fashion uh, characters. Um, and to me, they are kind of, they're sort of living, breathing people that I, that I create from my imagination and I like, placing them in the world or um, positioning them in places I've visited myself. Um, so I think that that whole world of the imagination for me is um, definitely a part of my work, which, which in a way sort of makes me, you know, adore artists like uh, Edward Hopper and um, some of the people that you've, that you've mentioned because they have these sort of interior worlds as well. So mm -hmm. there's all sorts of blurred edges around illustration. And um, it's sometimes it's misleading to, to categorize these different areas um, overly. You know, I, I think um, there's, there's so much crossover between fine art and illustration and stage design or design for video games or, you know, all, all of these things are interconnected really dance music I, I really think all the arts are connected and um you know different fields can inspire inspire each other right i certainly feel that the uh, um that fashion illustration provided a jump off point 
for my fine art. Um, as I, as the fashion illustration career kind of um, slowed down, there was still a creative being that need a creative energy that needed to be satisfied. And I moved from the fig drawing figures to drawing environments and, and trees. And, and at this point it's all, I'm working more in color in terms of making the color of my story as opposed to um, a, an image. But it all kind of um, grew from those early years of learning how to draw to making fashion illustrations that sold an item to doing fine art that enhances someone's um, space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's great. Um, so I think we, um, we, we probably have a bunch of questions. Do we wanna get to the questions? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I, I'm not 100% sure how to do that. Uh, here well, we go. Chat, yeah. Okay, so Sally English Colner wants to know uh, who are some artists, and I, I'll put, pose these questions and like one or two of you can answer. We don't all have to answer. Who, um, oh, Sally, we sort of have answered your question. Who are some artists you studied or continue to be inspired by outside of fashion illustration? Um, so if, I think we have answered that one. Alice Johnson wants to know for Stephen Stippelman, can you tell us more about the Jackie Kennedy illustrations? Well, again, I never saw Jackie Kennedy. I never saw the clothes and I had to work from portraits of her and little croquis of from, it was Galatine, it was uh, a couple of the Ta Patrick the Barons and Valentino, a lot of them in their early sixties. And what, I got so used to that, that during the Princess Diana period and then MC Reagan period, I would literally go up to a designer like Adolfo and he would have a blouse, a wrap blouse on a dress form in silk and say, Mrs. Bloomingdale is buying that in gold lame down to the floor with a slit in the back and it's good. And I would sit there and do it. I'd go back to women's where they give me photographs of her. I would draw her. For years, people thought I went to all those parties, but I didn't want to. I didn't, I went to some, but I found it fascinating. I was, that was one of the things I was able to do. And um, I, I like, that was something that really excited me to do that, to draw the unknown. When Carolyn uh, and, and Grace Kelly's daughter got married, we were in a phone conversation with Dior and I would sketch the dress. And when, you know, and it always, and when it comes out accurate, it's such a great feeling. And that was, most of the stuff I did at Women's Wear, I did never saw clothes. You were cheated out of going to those parties, Stephen. Well, I did get to a few, but <laughs> basically at Women's Wear, we never saw clothes, right, Glenn, never. Everything were these Rare. designer sketches that weren't very accurate. They were more no, emotional terrible. than anything. And you had to, turn it into a, you had to bring it to life. Make it real. Make it real and, and, and make someone want it. And oftentimes like Stephen, you'd go into the market and you'd have to do this type of um, uh, thing right, right there in the moment. I mean, those years were amazing having that kind of demand and that kind of abbreviation in terms of your time. It was it was wonderful. Mm. Yeah, the women's wear. I mean, there isn't really women's wear still exists and it's still an important force. But in, in the '60s and '70s, it was it was read by a much broader audience, so it was even more influential. Um, what and this is for everybody, Sally English. Um, I'm sorry, Sally. I'm going to mispronounce your your last name, Coloner. Um, what recommendations do you have for new fashion illustrators that are trying to get their work recognized, picked up by retailers, designers, et cetera? Is it okay to send fashion illustrations directly to art directors? Anyone have any suggestions for Sally? Well, yeah, my suggestion is first, uh, fine tune your craft. You need to work on developing uh, something, a style that's unique and particular to you. Uh, 
I would visit um, the agencies that represent fashion illustrators to look at the work that is, would be your competition. And then you need to resource and find out who are the art buyers for the department stores or the magazines uh, or the art directors. And I, there's no harm in sending something that's handmade. You know, it, it, you need to create something that's going to speak a little differently than somebody sending, here's my website, check out my work, to make some sort of personal connection. Just a suggestion, I mean, that's, that's what I would do. I think today um, people are much more appreciative of a personal connection than just saying, can you check my work out on the website? That, that's mm -hmm. just a suggestion. Yeah, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> okay. Um, I know this is a, Linda Jacobs yeah, wants I, to say, I would as a say fashion, to I'm, so, I'm sorry, Jason, sorry. I, I would advise, you know, keep sketchbooks and draw, draw, keep just draw as much as possible. Every opportunity, draw on the subway, draw your friends and family um, and get lots of practice in. I, I think that's incredibly important. Um, create a sort of, you know, an Instagram profile where you can showcase your work. Um, probably a website as well. And um, I, I guess email people or find out the names of art directors. And um, as Bill said, illustration agencies approach them because having a great collaborators is, is incredibly important. So um, an illustration agents will be able to give you good advice as well, even if they don't necessarily um, choose to represent you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and Linda Jacobs just wanted to, she, this is more of a, um, a compliment as a fashion illustration student at Moore College of Art from 78 to 82. Stephen and Kenneth were our daily inspiration. We read W and Women's Wear and cherish their illustrations. Thank you for sharing this personal time with us. I am grateful. That was very nice. Um, okay. Do you all love fashion and certain fashion designers? Well, I think it's safe to say you all love fashion, but, um, <laughs> or you're in the wrong field, right? Um, any specific designers working now that you're really excited by? I love Scaparelli. <laughs> I'm just excited because it, it, it's uh, dramatic and it's adventurous. I love Dior, of course. I love Valentino. Um, I, I would never say I have a favorite designer because they changed so frequently. I have favorite collections depending on the season. Mm -hmm. And as an illustrator, I look for shapes, you know, what I can and put, what I can and can't put in and textures and movement and fluidity. And that's just a personal, you know, what works for my. Right, vision. right. And, um, I, I like individual garments more than designers. Hmm. I think that period of fashion, when a designer dictated, allowed you to like the work of a designer. But I think now, when I was just through Burgos and Saks this week, there are garments that speak to me, not a designer's whole body of work. I love Valentino, what they're doing now. I love some of the Dior stuff. And then it's an individual garment that, that I like more than a designer, the, the, a designer's label. Mm -hmm. Do you still collect um, fashion, Stephen? Because I know- I have closets full of Norell's and Galanos, Balenciaga. I should have a fire sale. I don't even know what oh. <laughs> closets full. Okay, boy. Did you pick up anything this week? No, I stopped. I actually stopped. I you, bought you, something about three months ago and I said, I'm going to do it again. And I stopped. That's it. Uh, There's okay. no room for it. My closets look like the uh, fashion diva lived in, lived in here, you know, who's still living in the past. Well, that's the truth. <laughs> and well, Daniel no, Roseberry no, Scaparelli actually was a student of mine. No, ah. Brilliant student, yeah. Okay. Um, Glenn and, and Jason, um, fashion designers working now that are really, in, that you're excited by, maybe even could be a Uniqlo's dress that you saw this week, any? Um, you know, I, fi I find that, um, that I don't look at fashion as much as I used to. I don't follow it. Um, but if I see something that I really like, it doesn't have to be from this era at all. Um, I'm just, um, someone has sent me these um, 
Dior by Gianfranco Ferre. And it was haute couture and it was like the ultimate in luxury and motion. And it was like, you just get wrapped up in that feeling. And that's what makes you wanna be a fashion illustrator. And I don't really feel that I see that often enough in the, what's on the um, runways these days. And I think that it's as much the attitude and the personality that the models br bring to the presentation of the clothes as anything that enlivens them and makes them very um, appealing to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Jason is... Um, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm sort of drawn to quite minimal things. So I, I love sort of vintage Balenciaga. Uh, um, I, I was lucky enough to show some of my work at the Balenciaga Museum in Spain and seeing a whole museum of his work was incredibly beautiful and incredibly mm. inspiring. Um, I, I was also lucky enough to once meet Yves Saint Laurent, which was one of the kind of highlights of my life in a way. And I, I love Saint Laurent as a brand. Um, and I, I think it's, it's just a, a beautiful kind of label. And I'm really interested, I'm always interested in seeing their collections. Mm -hmm. Muccia Prada is obviously incredible as well. I love, I love most of the things that she does. Um, and Chanel, again, an incredible brand that I, that I love and um, look back at some of the previous collections that Karl Lagerfeld um, created and I, I actually love Karl Lagerfeld's style as well maybe not all of his sartorial choices but the things he had around him and um, Connie mentioned the auction he had they had at Sotheby's in uh, in Paris recently um, so I think his style and aesthetic is, is something that, that does it still inspire me. Mm -hmm. um, Fendi um, some some Tom Ford as well I really like um, so so quite a range really um, but but I I do tend towards the minimal is is what I sort of prefer and um, to be honest I get kind of slightly maybe I'm getting a bit older but I get slightly horrified by some of the things which um, come down the catwalk from time to time these days but um, I, I prefer kind of a bit of a elegance and um, what things that I consider to be beautiful. But um, yeah, okay. that's my- and Recently, idea. I just quickly want to say this, I'm sorry, but I recently had a, an, an amazing opportunity to work with a fashion designer side by side, a fashion designer named Ralph Rucci, who is just for me extraordinary. And we sat there and I did the illustrations of almost like a woman's wear daily type of thing. There were no actual garments, there were flat sketches. But to have the opportunity to sit with someone of that, that vision where he would speak about Tironi fabrics and the colors and, and how it moved. And he didn't want, he actually didn't want uh, accurate illustrations. He wanted to create, he wanted the essence of the illustrator, uh, mm -hmm. of the illustration to reflect his garments. Um, I have to say this man always inspires me with his work. Um, so I just mm -hmm. have to say. Yeah. Okay, that, no, that's great. That's great. Um, we have a, an interesting question from an anonymous attendee. How do you keep it loose, keep from getting um, tight and precious? Anyone have thoughts on that? Yeah. I think, yeah, go back to basics, grab a piece of charcoal and a big piece of paper and, you know, draw your cat or, you know, that kind of thing. Just do anything to kind of loosen up don't be afraid to make a mess and um just go for it maybe draw with your left hand or um but but use some quite basic brutal piece of you know uh, art materials that's that's that, what I that, that's the question i get every day find it from from there. There. <laughs> i don't yeah. i think loose i think there's a natural affinity for your work to be loose and i think there's a natural affinity for your work to be tighter but I think the more important thing is mess up and make a mistake, ruin something and learn from it. And mm. I think precious is when you want everything to always be good. Um, but you, you learn from mistakes. And I, but I don't think everyone could be loose. Uh, maybe mm. that's because I'm teaching a lot. 
That's and a very good point, Steve. That it's always that good to be loose. I think there's room for everybody, but I think the important thing is to mess up and not think that everything has to be perfect all the time. Mm -hmm. It's important to break your habits. We all have habits. We all have a specific system that we start working. You need to break it. If you start at the top of the page, start at the bottom. If you mm -hmm. do draw with your right hand, try your left hand. If there's a medium you hate, use it. Use it, yeah. Break, draw with a fork, for God's sakes. You know, go and get a fork and throw it in some ink and draw it and mess it up like Stephen said and screw up. Give yourself permission to fail because mm -hmm. if you're not willing to fail, you won't succeed. That, that to me, is a, a key strategy in, in any art form, whether it's dance, whether it's music, or whether it's art. Give it a shot. Absolutely. Um, Edwina Owens Elliott thinks it's hilarious, Stephen that you never went to the parties because everyone thought you went to the parties. So I, we're all I, a little disappointed. I did go to a few, and I remember one in particular, I had to do the portraits of the women in their dress. And I went to a lot of them, but not um, all over the world every week. Um, but I had to do a portrait of this one woman in a dress. And I was a little tired because she wasn't the first one I had to do. And it was a one shoulder dress. and. It was with marker and I drew it on the other shoulder. <laughs> so what I did, I just, she didn't get it. She didn't catch it, but um, I just had to let it go. No, I did draw a lot at the occasion and it, it was fun. I think the immediacy and I think the deadlines and I think, I think that has helped my work tremendously. Like where you have to do it. I remember one time we had an advance at Dior in Paris and I told my, the story to my class many times, I had a little bit to drink the night before and the mo 12 models came in and my head was pounding and I looked at the white paper and it was so white and my marker was so black and I just said, here we go. And I did them. And I think that's what you have to just be able to perform. You can't say, you have to be on time. You have to perform, that's it. And mm -hmm. that's what I think is one of the most important things to keep a career. Right. Anyone could start a career, but not a lot of people could keep it. Right. Deadlines are everything when it comes to fashion and, and, and especially everything. in newspaper. Everything. everything. Well, the next question, um, Bill, you sort of have you answered already. It's also from an anonymous attendee. When I practice drawing, should I use um, a medium I'm comfortable with or try new? new mediums and you you know just basically answered that are there big differences the same person asked between practice drawing in life compared to practice by drawing on computer and using books and computer as a reference um jason you talked about that a yeah I, I i think if you're a you know a young person just just kind of learning your craft if you like then there's there's no substitute really for drawing from life I think get a sketchbook, take it around with you everywhere you go. And, and if you get opportunities to travel um, and you can take it, you know, perhaps not at the moment, but um, when we can all travel a bit more again, there's, it's incredibly valuable to actually sort of take a trip somewhere and draw in your sketchbook, draw other passengers, draw in a cafe. Um, for me, I found travel illustration really incredibly useful and I've got you know dozens and dozens of sketchbooks from all sorts of trips going back to when I was a teenager um, and, and as Stephen was saying I, I think that teaches you the discipline of working under pressure in quite stressful situations um, maybe being jostled in a market in Mexico or wh wherever it may be um, I, I really is is incredibly good experience and i and i think that's a great way to um to get better as an illustrator sometimes even drawing from if you're really stuck i did this when i was a student is to draw from a department store window or a boutique window go there very early in the morning before anybody's in the street and it's the closest thing you'll get to a person at least you'll see real clothes and how it falls and it mm -hmm. better than nothing well, a lot better than nothing. That's a good suggestion. Um, this is um, from John Coburn from 
Bill, um, he says he missed your chat about Instagram. Do you feel I should be more consistent with my style posting mostly black and white or is mixing paintings into the wall too confusing? Well, it depends yeah. on who That's you're an Insta who you're Instagram, about, about posting on Instagram. Oh, just have fun. <laughs> just have fun. Okay. Just have fun, John. Just chill, relax. <laughs> um, you know, just it, it's Instagram. And I was advised by a PR person like post once a day, you know, do, if, if you're trying to garner an audience. And, and Instagram is a tool of entertainment, folks. Right. So keep that in mind. You want to entertain your audience. And if you're posting five black and white drawings in a row, Throw in some color. That's just you know what I would suggest. So does, does every um, Bill? Are you the? Does everybody have a um, Jason? Are you on Instagram? I am. Yes. Um. Yep. Yeah, Jason Brooks Art. So yes. Um. I'm. I'm learning from what Bill's just said. So that's uh, that's useful for me. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I have Instagram and Facebook as well, but I'm not um very good at it. I think that that's a skill in and of itself. I'd rather that's a career in and of itself. Um, mm. But uh, I, I do like the responses that I get. Well, that's good. And Stephen, are you on Instagram? Whoops. I think you're muted. I, think you're muted. I am on it, but right. I don't know how to do it. Ronaldo Barnetti helped me one time and we posted about 75 drawings and everyone said, why are you posting all these drawings? But that has to last me a few years. Okay. Well, you know, he did the 75, that's you're, you're good for a while, right? Oh, that's going to last me for another three years, yeah. Okay, well, that's good. So you save yourself time that way. Um, so here's a, um, maybe this will be, oh no, we have a few more down here. At what age did you all realize that you wanted to pursue a career in fashion illustration? Um, Glenn? I can start with that. It was, um, the, I can tell you today, it was the day I walked into the fashion illustration co uh, class that I hadn't originally planned to take at Cass Tech and um, suddenly saw something I didn't even know existed. And that was the idea of drawing beautiful women. And from that mo moment on, I was, um, captivated by it. And it was the class of all my classes that I looked forward to um, every week. It was the class that I excelled in and always got the best grades. And um, I don't know, it, was, it just called to me. But uh, until I walked into that classroom, I didn't know it existed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bill, do you, do, do you remember how old you were when you thought this I might do. be your I was idea? probably, um, I was a kid. I was watching, um, I was fascinated with movement. And uh, I saw this film with Audrey Hepburn and, and uh, <laughs> Sabrina, and she has one of Givenchy gown, same story, and she crossed the ballroom. And I've never seen anything like that in my life. That was just this glamour and her elongation and this, she was elegant and, and chic and I wanted to draw it I didn't want to paint it I didn't want to photograph it I didn't want to make a design of it I I didn't know fashion illustration existed and in high school I met my best friend Ken Bonavita Paula and the two of us liked to draw and at that time it wasn't very uh uh let's put it wasn't you know it wasn't conducive to boys drawing at that time in, in my neighborhood which was an Irish Italian blue collar working place neighborhood so we would uh, go down, go to his house. His mom had Harper's Bazaars and Vogue's. And we would go through the magazine. His dad would say, what are you guys doing? We said, we're doing, we're doing homework. Okay, great. We were not doing homework. We were drawing Barbra Streisand and Sheer and designing <laughs> clothing for them. But I drew better than he did. And he designed better than I did. And that's when I realized that um, I wanted to be a fashion illustrator. So that basically was the genesis of the moment when I thought this is what I'm going to do. Jason, do you recall how old you were? Um, yes, well, I think with, for me, um, I would say I was more, probably more of an artist who loved drawing people and loved kind of style um, in a way, rather than setting out to be a fashion illustrator. Um, so 
I just started drawing when I was, you know, two or three years old and sort of never really stopped. Um, but I think the fashion illustration thing was more um, something that other people started attaching to me rather than a conscious choice. Um, I just sort of became known as a fashion illustrator, but it, it wasn't really what I set out to do necessarily. I just wanted to be an artist who, who loved drawing people and loved traveling and, and loved, loved style and, um, and fashion kind of came into that. So it, it wasn't necessarily a conscious choice in a way, but uh, yeah. Okay. Stephen, do you recall the age you were? About? Yeah, I always, I always like to draw people more than anything else in the world. Okay. And I went to, high, to music and art high school and I was a fine arts major. And I took, like Glenn, I took one fashion class, but, and that in those days, if you told the fine arts teacher you wanted to do fashion, it was like telling your mother you want to sell drugs. I mean, you just <laughs> didn't do it. But I was always fascinated by it. And it did happen in the early 60s with Jacqueline Kennedy, Audrey Hepburn, and Kenneth Paul Block's drawings. And a cover of Life magazine with Norel feathered coat and the sequin dresses inside. And then wow. I said, done, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, well, I don't, do we have, uh, Connie, do you know, do we have, do you want, should I? Do we have time for more questions or do you have I something think, you want to? Yeah, I think maybe like a couple more. Um, there is a question that I have noticed. Um, uh, okay. Now I've lost it. There's been so many questions. It's fabulous. I, just a quick thing that somebody wrote that they were wondering why there wasn't a woman on the panel. Oh, that's the one I was looking for. Yeah. And do you want to talk about Gladys not being able to participate? Or... Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we, I mean, honestly, we could have had, I would have loved to have had 10 or 15 illustrators on this uh, panel this evening. Um, and for with time restraints and with uh, time zones um, and just the availability of people, um, we had to narrow it down. Um, and I really wanted two contemporaries and two of, I hate to say it, but like the older school, that means Glenn and even um, because I feel that was such a really crucial time in fashion illustration um, and without them we wouldn't have the Bills and the and the Jasons um, of today but there are so many incredible women illustrators now um, and we were meant to have one but as I say time zones didn't work um, but I think what's really interesting and I wrote this the other day is that fashion illustration used to be drawn by men worn by women and and to a large extent fashion design was designed by men worn by women but it has been a seismic change and it is so fabulous to see so many young female um, illustrators working today and successfully working and there was a there was a mention in the chat just now of um when we were talking or when jason was talking about nfts um, and uh, Blair Bla Blainstein, I can never pronounce her name. I'm sorry, Blair, I love your work. Um, I, it, it was mentioned in the chat that she um, had a sale of NFTs and it sold out instantly. Now mm. she's a fabulous example. Toby Gideo is another fabulous example um, of really fantastic female illustrators. So please don't take the fact that we didn't have a female on this particular panel as any Thing other than we're championing fashion illustration across the board. Okay. Yeah, here, here. There's there are lots of absolutely brilliant um, female fashion illustrators out there, and um, so it's a it's a shame it's a shame there aren't isn't someone represented on this particular panel. But um, but you could I'm see sure so much of it in the exhibit right at and, some point. Yeah. Yes, there is. There are quite a few women in the exhibit at uh, that Gray MCA has has um, put together. Mm -hmm. um, should we have a, a practical, here's a practical question. What's the best way to store your past works? Um, this anonymous attendee has a pile of works from 10 years ago and has no idea how to properly keep them. Hmm. What would you I, say I would that? say sort of have an edit, first of all, maybe you don't need to keep everything. Um, 
so edit out what really you don't need or loose bits of paper and um <coughs> you know there's no point storing things you don't actually want uh, can i um, just interrupt that yeah no, sorry that is one of the <laughs> that is that is one of my biggest problems is it the is fashion illustration was never kept um mm -hmm. all the 20th century mm -hmm. fashion illustrators rene gruel boucher ericsson pierre morgue all of them um mm were never they never thought and Stephen himself said earlier he gave you know he used to just, just give his drawings away left mm, right and center yeah. um and so yes throw stuff away but don't throw too much no away. no Seriously. i don't <laughs> throw away as a as a thing. gallery yes. no you're I need right your probably. work <laughs> i mean i'm really talking about you know editing one's own work and um yeah Things which you, you, there may be some things in there which you don't need, but you're right, Connie. It is heartbreaking to think of all the Andy Warhols that have been thrown oh, away by art editors. Right. And so it on. also depends how much space you have. I have mine in yeah. in Manila, big Manila envelopes. I have mine broken down by year and category. But oh, if I had the background that Bill Nonaman had, I could store it differently. <laughs> well, I know that um, Karen Santry, who was mentioned earlier, she and um, a couple of other illustrators helped Kenneth Paul Block organize his archive. And it was all in flat files. And there was, you know, special archival paper between each drawing. And those oh, drawings, because um, I did the book with him and then helped facilitate uh, the donation of his archive to the Museum of um, fine arts in Boston, those drawings, even the ones from the 50s and the late 40s were in excellent shape. Very little um, was was not in the type of shape that it could be exhibited because it had been stored that way. He so, was one of the smart ones. Antonio as well was another really smart one who, mm -hmm. you know, used to request their work back yes. and, and kept it. And so now there's a phenomenal archive, um, mm -hmm. both of Kenneth's work and Antonio's. Yep. Um, okay, I actually, I think we've sort of, I'm not, I'm not looking at the chat, Connie, I mean, I want to make sure I'm doing this correctly. I'm looking at the, the questions themselves. Is that? Yeah, I mean, it's okay. been fabulous. We could be here for another hour if we were Yeah, I think we pretty things. much covered, there are a couple of questions that are sort of repeats of questions that we've, um, oh, here's a, well, a practical question for um, Lindsay. There ex is ex Society of Illustrators going to have sketch nights again soon, do we know? I don't know. Um, well, we'll ask Lindsay to put that in any follow-up materials or she maybe she can add that into the chat. Um, yes, okay, I see anyone it. Anyone in, in, anyone yes. in New York um, at the moment, um, please, if you want to come and see the phenomenal work of all these artists that we've had this evening framed and how much some of them may say illustration and fine art, there can be a difference. In my opinion, there is no difference. And when you see these work framed on the wall, you will see just how exquisite um, and historically important um, each one of these artists is. A million thanks to people like you. <laughs> yeah. Really, no. thank you, Connie. Thank you. Connie, thank it's you, so Connie. amazing and it's so important that all this work is a part of Master Drawings. It's such a big deal. Congratulations. Yeah, Didier Aaron Gallery on East 67th Street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, I I think we've um, I think we've pretty much covered the questions. So thank, thank you, you. Thank to you. to everybody for participating and Connie, thank you so much for organizing this. Well, I'm just so grateful that you could all join us and um, maybe we can do this again um, next year or the year after. Um, and please visit GrahamCA um, www.grahamca.com. Um, because you can see a considerable volume of all these artists' work um, on our website and also the 20th century artists, um, which are really important because they are they they tie in obviously to today's artists. So please visit. And thank you, Society of Illustrators. And yes, Society of Illustrators, Anel and Lindsay. And thank you, Susan, so for narrating it. Thank you, Susan. It's and we pleasure. originally were meant to be doing this in person, but of course yes. with COVID. So it's it's been amazing that you uh, the society just said absolutely we'll just move it online and Susan I want to say a big thank you to you um, I highly respect your writing and I love your Kenneth Paul Block book particularly um, and it's an honour to have you 
moderating this. Well, I, it was a pleasure and I enjoyed it. So thank you very thank much you, for Jesus. inviting me. Thanks. Thank okay. you all. Thanks, it was Tony. wonderful. And uh, it's you. a real honor to be here with you. You amazing illustrators as well. So great to meet you, Glenn and Stephen, and great to see you again, Bill. So same here, Jason. Thank you, Connie. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.